Excellent. Okay. So yeah, before we dive in, I'll do a quick little talk on the CTF toolkit. Um, this is one of the tools that I uh, that I use for a lot of uh, my Vulnhub boxes or, or CTFs or capture the flags or whatever you want to call them nowadays. Um, it's a little vanity project that I started, a few, I don't even know how long back now, not that long ago, a year or something like that, um, where I found that uh, for a lot of these challenges, I, I was always sort of looking at like Googling things and finding scripts. And then I would have like a notepad up maybe, and then I would just paste them all in there and then use that for some challenges. And then it would sort of disappear. And then, you know, I would do another challenge and it's like, oh man, I've, you know, I've, I wish I saved that thing because a lot of these, a lot of these challenges, there's, there's some things you kind of rinse and repeat. So you, um, you know, you, you'll find yourself using a lot of the same things over and over, at least that in early stages, recon specifically. Uh, and, and again, within, within the recon realm, whether it be web or network, whatever it is, um, you know, I'm more in the web space. So a lot of the, the tools I have are around that, but nonetheless, you'll find that you're yourself collecting scripts and collecting things or building your own scripts. Um, because a lot of that stuff you want to automate, or a lot of the stuff is just even without automation, you just find that you're a lot of times running the same commands over and over and over. So, you know, sure, memorization is good, but there's no way you can memorize everything. And uh, so anyway, I, when I started the CTF toolkit, I was like, oh, you know what, it'd be great if I had like a repository of like Kali tools and scrims, some scripts. And, and when I say scripts, uh, some of these maybe are actual scripts to do things. Um, but a, a lot of these, when I say scripts, it's, it's really just uh, which you'll see, but it's just sort of the script that you that launches the thing that you're doing. It has like the, the particular arguments or something. So like in map with some flags and then, you know, your target and stuff like that, which which then will execute, you know, a something to do something. Um, so a lot of it's, you know, really everything in here is just a rep repository, uh, an ongoing growing rep repository of things that I use and or that I've gotten feedback uh, with others that use. And the way that it's sort of laid out is sort of the the order of operations that one might do, you know? So if for here is our sort of enumeration phase, right? And we always start off with enumeration whenever we're doing an engagement assessment, whatever, own hub box, capture the flag, all that stuff. There's, you always got to start with enumeration. You either got to find the targets or if you're given targets, you got to figure out like what's open on them, what's running. So you have your enumeration phase. And then we actually go to our exploit phase. Once we find potential holes or whatever it is or possible ways in, then we start trying to do exploitation. Once we've done the exploit, typically then we're at the part of the, like the last phase, the last phase is post exploitation, which is usually like, you know, maybe part of Privesk or some part of persistence. Um, and then, you know, depending on where you're at, there could be little like micro branches where, you know, a lot of this might rinse, like a lot of these, this might repeat a few times, you know, you enumerate and say you get onto the box and you've done some exploitation. Now you're onto the box. Well, then you kind of start over a little bit, right? You go back to enumeration. Now you're in the box. You have to enumerate, well, what's in the box? What, what can I do? And then sort of, you know, go back through them. So anyway, so this is sort of laid out in that, in that fashion uh, of those phases, if you will, of that. But in any case, they're basically just, uh, again, you know, scripts to help me, to help anyone along the way in their journey of doing challenges or just hacking in general. Uh, I think there's a lot of good things here for uh, people kind of just getting into it. It's fairly simple, straightforward. Um, but in any case, again, I just got tired of kind of going to different places to gather things. So I just sort of made, made a repository that I built this to, you know, I literally use this all the time. So um, but at the same time, I, you know, for, what it's worth. Uh, I built it in React. At, at that time, I was trying to get into React, um, so which is an awesome library of JavaScript. But anyway, anyway um, so yeah, so that's the CTF toolkit. So you'll find that pretty much probably all the walkthroughs that I do, it's probably like one of the first things that I mentioned of what I leveraged to do, you know, said hacks or whatever. Um, so we'll definitely be visiting this a, a few times uh, during today's walkthrough. Uh, and then with that said, we will jump into uh, Drifting Blues 4, and the box can be found here, which is right here, uh, on the Vulnhub. Uh, Vulnhub.com is essentially a repository for thousands of vulnerable boxes. Uh, some have some authors maybe have one-offs, or maybe they've only done one box. This particular author has done a series called Drifting Blues. There are nine boxes. This is four of nine. Um, so obviously, many more to come. So far, all the previous three have been up uh, or have been, uh, we've done walkthroughs for them. They are up on YouTube. Uh, this will be no different at some point. 
I'll get around to editing this and get this up on YouTube. So if you can't catch the whole thing or, or you want to rewatch it, um, that'll be a place. But essentially, it's, it's an OVA you download. And then from there, you just start hacking. Sometimes you're given a little bit of information. Uh, in this particular instance, it says description, get flags. That's pretty straight to the, to the point. We don't really know how many, but we kind of do because I've, I've done a few of these and you, you, you know, you start, uh, you'll start seeing patterns. Um, difficulty says easy. That's uh, in the eye of the beholder. It could say easy, but it could be nearly impossible for you and or vice versa. Maybe it says difficult, but maybe it's super easy for you. So I, I love the fact that they do put a difficulty on these, but at the same time, just, you know, be cautious um, because again, it, easy to someone isn't easy to someone else. So, um, and that's pretty much it for this. Sometimes there's more information. Sometimes there's less. This is pretty sparse in, in what it is we're doing. Nonetheless, uh, there's a link. This is, this is where you would get the actual OVA here um, to do the install into whatever your player of choice. But for the most part, a lot of these are done in virtual box on VolnHub. So just as an FYI, um, which is one of the reasons why I work primarily out of virtual box um, is because a lot of the boxes I do are from VolnHub and it just makes life easy when you don't have to fight with your VM and or player to, to work or to load or, or whatever. Um, so that's a little bit of information about the box, tools I use to hack this box, uh, CTF toolkit, um, Nmap, Hydra, Google. And I have a note here basically saying, if you solve the previous box, remember there's, there's multiples of these drifting blues. Uh, if you solve three, um, the last challenge in this will be very, it will be easy. Uh, out, outside of that, if you have not, then it will probably be a very difficult box for you. But in any case, that's some just high overview of, uh, of what the box is and then the tools that I used um, to hack. So with that said, we'll sort of jump in. Uh, like everything, I take notes. I take notes along the way. I recommend everyone taking notes, uh, whatever the form is, it doesn't matter. Notepad, um, code editors, you know, Google Docs, whatever it is. I've done them. I've used the majority of those. I landed on Cherry Tree a while back. Um, I like that um, just because of the structure and because of just some, the way that it kind of works. I, I, I like the, the layout and some of those things. Uh, it helps me sort of stay on track, stay focused. Uh, for one, for reporting purposes, but also for repeatability. I should be able to, at any time, I mean, granted, it's, it really depends on how good your notes are, but at any time, I should be able to go back to a box and do it just off of my notes. I should be able to literally go step by step. And or if I was to give this to someone else, would they be able to reproduce that? And if they could, then that's a good job on the notes. If they can't, then either my notes aren't that good or maybe the person attempting to do this is um, not quite as experienced yet and maybe not the best um, box for them to start on or something. But in any case, notes recommended, you gotta take notes. Even if it's not something that you're doing professionally, I just highly recommend notes for multiple reasons. Again, if you ever wanna do the box, again, you have that, but for the most part, I can I promise you that you will, there are certain things you will do more than once and over and over. And it's nice to have records of, an attack you did that worked or didn't work, it helps you get out of ruts. So even if it's just for your own good, um, I can't stress enough um, how important notes are. The good thing about Cherry Tree is it, it's, it's in Cali. I think it, I think starting this year, this year, I can't remember when they put it in, but it's, it's a new addition that, as far as I know, a newish addition, which is nice. Um, but I do know that there's a Cherry Tree for Windows. I'm not sure about Mac, but I believe it's a free open source thing. So it probably exists in Mac, but I know that it had, they have it for Linux specifically. It comes in Kali. Um, and again, it does, they do have a Windows version. So with that said, uh, like anything, um, you know, we typically will start off with um, basically trying to figure out who we are so we know that what the target looks like. <clears throat> so who we are is uh, this, this is the segment I have my, my knuck on, uh, specifically the, the VM, the VM sort of network. So uh, virtual box essentially is running out of this 56 subnet, right? My, my home sort of thing is, is running out of this, this subnet, um, without getting into two details, maybe we'll cover in the lab. I just, just note that, uh, all the VMs that I run are going to end, are going to have this octet here. And it helps me also not only keep them separated, but Part of the separation is nice because it, it, it allows me to easily identify other things on my network. 
Um, so before we start looking for things, right, I have to spin things up. So again, for anyone new to VirtualBox, um, essentially it, it's a VM player. So you can see I have a, a bunch of VMs loaded here. Um, Drifting uh, Blue Dante, Store. Yes. I, I'm going to jump in. Are, you're showing the CTF toolkit on your screen. Are you intended to show your other boxes? Oh, thank you for pointing that out. I, yeah. Okay. Well, we, well, the good news is you haven't really missed anything. So but let me, <laughs> let me, let me fix you that. You start talking about Octa. I'm going, well, I'm looking at your enumeration screen <laughs> here. No, what, no, what I must have accidentally uh, okay. shared the, uh, just the app and not the. Yeah. Great. Oh, All here right. we go. Desktop. Thank you for calling that out. That would have sucked. I get through the whole talk. I know. I'm sorry, the... What are you talking about? <laughs> that would be You're hilarious. Like, pointing to it. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So again, you haven't missed anything other than the fact that, uh, again, Cherry Tree looks like this, but you'll see as I go under, or as I do dive more and more into uh, you know, the walkthrough, you'll, you'll get a good taste of what Cherry Tree looks like. Um, again, before we get into what's what and all that good stuff, we have to first fire up the VM. So, um, you know, again, here we have um, the Drifting Blues. This is the OVA that I mentioned before. So again, going back to um, here, this is where the box came from. These are the, the tools that I used. There's a link to it if you happen to, to want to try and hack along or whatever. These are the tools. And then again, I have the note about uh, if you've solved the previous box, definitely solving box four will help. But again, specifically, this is where you would go in, in vulnhub.com to grab this box. You can search by author or search by series. This is the fourth box. Again, you get a little bit of information, nothing special. Um, sometimes it's sparse, sometimes it's very verbose. But for the most part, this is where you would go to get the OVA. Once you have the OVA, this is pretty much where, where I just left off. Uh, you're going to install that into your player of choice. Again, a lot of these boxes are are have been created with and or have been tested with VirtualBox. So I'll, you will probably have very few issues if you're using VirtualBox when using VulnHub, because a lot of these are done in VirtualBox and of an OVA sort of format. So <clears throat> that's why I switched kind of from like VMware over to OVA or sorry, over to um, VirtualBox. But in any case, once you have it, you can see here, I have a, some basic settings. Mostly the network is what's important here. Um, you can see that I have a host only. So that means that essentially the host and the, uh, the, the child or whatever you want to call this, the VM can talk to each other, but that's about it. Um, it can't really get out to do anything. I don't believe anything else can get to it uh, on the network. So it's a little secluded. So part of that is for security. Part of that also is just, uh, that's just kind of the, the way that I like to run um, these. So basically once you have it installed and set up and configured and all that good stuff, you're going to launch the OVA, which is actually launching the instance that we're going to attack or try and you know break into, get the flags. And once it's running, this is pretty much it. This is this is this is all there is now to this. Uh, we will put this away and then ignore it because we're not going to try and log in through here. There is we don't know a login. That's a common question that I see is, hey, I uh, I, I opened the box, I got it running, uh, but I don't know how to log in. That's the whole point. That's what, we're here, that's what we're here to do. We're here to break into these things. Um, so once this is up and running, you can just you know minimize it, whatever you do, hide them, put them away. Um, we're gonna get into them how it was intended, how uh, basically hack into them, if you will. Um, so that all starts with, we have to identify it, right? We have it running on our network now, uh, at least in some, some fashion, we have VirtualBox running. And inside of that, we have a VM running of the, of the uh, Drifting Blues 4 box, the vulnerable box. Um, so that now we have to figure out, well, where is it? Like, how, how do we hack it? We, we have to find it. Um, so this is, again, part of where I left off uh, before realizing I wasn't sharing my entire screen is that uh, my VM network or my uh, virtual box network is on this 56 subnet. My home network is on this subnet. So I, 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 I don't let them mingle, but for the most part, it also helps me identify these boxes, uh, these vulnerable boxes, because... I typically only have one or two or three maybe running at one time, which means that if when I do an in map, which we'll do here in a second against this octet, uh, I'm not going to get, I'm only going to get back very, very few results. In this case, I'm only going to get back one result because I only have one VM running as opposed to if I didn't do it and I said it maybe in bridged or somehow I had it attached to my home network, uh, it would, it would be lost in a sea of devices. You know, it could be like one of 50. And in, at that point, it's kind of, you know, it might be very difficult for someone to try and figure out, well, which one of these is, is the VM. 
And I mean, back in the day, it was one of these things where I would like, I would write everything down and then I would turn it off and then I would see which one disappeared <laughs> and then I would turn it back on and then see which one popped back up. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's the, the target. Um, that's definitely one way of how you find something, but that's definitely not the probably most efficient. And again, you know, taking the uh, security into consideration. This helps with that as well. So, so um, Dante, I just have a question. So you're yeah. recommending this way you're putting your home net networking in one subnet and this, this thing you're running for uh, hacking a uh, different subnet. That's what your recommendation is. So that way you know what what you're trying to do, right? You're not messing up your home. Yeah, home part, part of it is just segmentation mm -hmm. for security right. purposes. And then part of that also is identifying devices. So if, if, if on this right. 56, if I know that this is only used for VMs, then <laughs> then when I scan this 56, I shouldn't expect a whole lot of results back. Correct. Uh, and then for this specific ex example, I I will I only have one uh -huh. box running, so I uh -huh. will only get back two results. One result will be my Cali box, uh -huh. and then one result will be the target. And I know what Cali yeah. I know what my Cali box is right here because it's it's telling me what my IP is for that. So the other mm -hmm. one that that's there. Is the, is the target. And so again, mm. once you spin up these boxes, just note that you got to figure out some way to find what the IP address is. Sometimes mm -hmm. maybe um, you're lucky enough to where the box running actually mm -hmm. will tell you here in this login, it might tell yeah. you like I, what the IP address is. Maybe it gives yeah. you some information to make your uh -huh. life easy, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always do that. And I've just gotten mm. into the habit of, you know, finding mm. myself versus okay. relying on you know, a VM. Okay. And, and Char made a comment about um, something that, uh, you may be, Char, you might be able to explain that later about why, why do you prefer Libvirt um, on Linux versus, you know, VirtualBox in. Yeah, I think that's definitely going to be something we could discuss um, yeah. on the, uh, in the lab, because there's, yeah. I, I know Char has a really, really awesome lab, and he's got a lot of really awesome things going, and, mm -hmm. and mine is probably more, like, mm -hmm. commercial, for lack of better terms, where, he, you know, he tends to, you know, and, it, and for me, it's just uh, the proprietary stuff was just easier. Uh, uh, again, well, well, that's a whole whole conversation. Whole talk, but, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's, there's no right or wrong, basically, at all. But in any case, so so moving on. So we can see here our first step, right? We have to, we have to enumerate um, what, let me back up here. We have to figure out, we have to find what our, um, what our target is. Uh, and that's going to be P, uh, shoot, I already forgot what the, uh, our nmap flag. So let's just go back to the toolkit and let me see if I even have it in there to just do a ping sweep. SN, yes, SN. So SN is just like a, uh, host only discovery. And essentially what that's going to do is just say, Hey, I just want to figure out who, what's, what's here. And so you can see here, I'm just doing my slash 24, right? Because let's just pretend I don't, I don't know. I wanted to scan the whole range. I don't know how many boxes might show up. Again, maybe you don't have your segmented and you need to scan your entire range to figure out what pops up. But essentially, I'm just telling Nmap here, like, hey, let's just do kind of like an ARP or ping sweep just to see who responds. And we're going to do, again, as we mentioned, this, the 56 subnet whole sort of slash 24. And so whatever shows up here is what's running on this dot 56. And like I mentioned before, I will only get two results, one of them being me as my Cali, one of them being the target. And so we can see here that this 117 address is this box. That is this thing running right here. That is my target. Again, it might be a little bit different for you. IP address ranges, it might be a little bit more difficult to find, but at some point when you kind of get um, a process down, I highly recommend just starting with the basics of segmenting maybe and or just uh, making identification very easy when you're doing these. Um, so now that we have our target, this 117, now we can actually do a little bit more of a, um, uh, a more in-depth in-map scan of the asset. Uh, we'll do, oops. You're just gonna do 117, right? Dot 117, is that? Yes, the, yep. Okay. So now that we know the target, we don't need to scan for ranges anymore. We know the target. And basically this little in-map script here um, I got from CTF Toolkit. And the good thing about CTF Toolkit is that now that I know my target, the cool thing I can do here is put it in here. And when I do that, we'll notice that everywhere I can inject this into our, our scripts will be done for us. 
So instead of it saying like example.com or whatever, now we have actual like targets. So now whatever I can copy and paste into everything that I'm doing, uh, it just, it just, it's a time saver. Again, I, I made this specifically for, for this, if that makes sense. So again, I got tired of copying yeah. and pasting, going to the Cali tools or Nmap, looking it up and then finding an example and then pasting right. it in like a notepad, but then you got to back out and put your real, your target and then mm-hmm. copy that and then paste right. that into your, or, you know, type stuff. So I'm just like, this just streamlines a lot of that. So now I can just literally copy this and, or come down. Here's a common script that I use. This is basically saying like, Hey, um, well, I'm, I'm not using the A right now, but essentially it's basically saying the V for verbose, meaning that it's going to print stuff as it, as it's finding things. So you don't have to like wait in suspense for, you know, who knows how long for it to run, basically trying to enumerate services. And then most importantly, which I will, I will always call out, please remember to add the all ports um, flag. That's very important because we don't know anything about this box. I don't, I don't know what's open. Well, I, I do because I, I solved it, but let's just pretend I've never seen this before. I don't know what's running. I don't know what services are running. I don't know what ports are open. There could be, it, there could be something open on, you know, port 65,000 or whatever it is, um, or 6,000. I forget what the, what the actual range is, but needless to say, if I don't include this, this P flag, it will only, in map by default, will only do like top, top ports or top 1,000 or common ones out of the 1,000. So you could be missing thousands of ports that could possibly be open and could potentially be your way into this. And then that case, you would never solve it because you would never ever find that potential foothold or door or port or whatever. So it's extremely important, but uh, like literally I could just click this copy button and then go into here and then I'll just erase this. And then I can just paste the paste that. And now it's pasted it as I would do it. I'm going to remove this A though, because sometimes that just takes forever. Um, and then we'll run it. So again, we are doing an Nmap scan just against the target. We figured out. And then this will give us some information. So right off the bat, looks like three services are running. We'll wait for this to finish. We already got some port information. So at least we already know these three, these three ports are open. And then pretty much the uh, SV takes a little bit longer to enumerate the actual services, which are always good to get. Maybe you, Maybe they give you some information that, that helps you. Maybe they don't, but it's always uh, a good habit to get them and to write them down because you never know uh, when you might need to know what a version is. So again, as I alluded to taking notes, extremely important. I was, the first thing you can see I did here after I found the target was run and map and then basically paste the results um, and then highlight what's important to me, which are essentially the open ports and their services. So for me, when I start my leverage cherry tree, I, I start making templates. I'll sort of do some pre-configured things here where I'll say, okay, let me just you know put these ports in there. Um, that way I, ha- I have them and I can kind of drill down into each thing that I'm doing. Um, so right now we're presented with three ports. Everyone has different workflows. Some start at the top, the bottom, pick randomly. I don't know, blindfold, throw a dart. For me, um, I'm a web guy. So anytime I see port 80 open, I'm typically going to hop over to there. Plus, as you find that as you do these challenges, you will find that a lot of them, a vast majority of them, part of the uh, process of getting into the box or onto the box is generally through some sort of web application. Um, so yeah, so Char chimed in. Hey, I'd probably check for you know to see if anonymous FTP is is first. Um, we will definitely get there. But again, everyone, there's no right or wrong. But, but just my workflow, in case you're wondering, oh, why did you start with the last one first? It's because port 80 is a web thing. So I generally check there. It could have been, it could have been the very, like the last of a thousand different ports. I'd still start, I'd still start here, you know, uh, have it, whether it be good or bad. So um, with that said, so first thing we could do is we know that port 80 is open. And for, for those that are familiar or not familiar, typically web applications run on port 80. So definitely, basically, you can just point your browser to that address and see if anything loads. And sure enough, we have what appears to be a website that says under construction. And you can see here on my port 80, I just logged under construction. Nothing special. Sometimes it could be a full-blown website. You never know, but it's, this is where I always start. Once we, one of the the... The things I recommend doing, again, everyone has their own workflows. Uh, by no means is what I'm what I'm doing probably the best, but the habits that I've occurred over the years, 
Uh, once I look at a web application, in this case, there's not much enumeration here. There's not much to scroll through, click on, none of that stuff. This is literally all you see. Um, I highly recommend though, always, 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 always viewing the page source. And for this example, this, this literally specific example is the why I always check and view the, the source. For those that you do or do not know HTML or any basic fundamentals of web programming, typically in HTML, this is a comment out. We can see here, I don't see that string. I don't see that, I don't see that on the page. Um, I'm left clicking and highlighting and dragging. It's not highlighting. It's not like it doesn't happen to be text. It just happens to be white, the kind of hidden, which is also done. Um, but that's not the case. It's, it's literally hidden because it's a comment. So I would never see that unless I looked at the source. Uh, right off the bat, I'm looking at this going uh, base 64. Again, once you start doing a lot of these boxes or start messing with different uh, encodings or encryptions, base 64 is probably the most common one used in a lot of these challenges. Um, and you can kind of start to recognize what it looks like. So again, going back to the notes, you can see here that the first thing I did when I went there, I viewed the source, clearly you can see here, and this is what I saw. And basically we have our uh, base 64. So what do we do? Well, we got to decode this, right? So I can just copy this <clears throat> and then shameless plug, <laughs> go back to the CTF toolkit. We have this little hidden eyeball thing, whatever, the uh, icon that I used. Um, click on base 64, we can drop it over here to decode, click on decode, and this is what the mess, this is what this decodes to. Go back intruder, and then it looks like we have, what do you know, some more base 64. So we're gonna copy that. We're gonna paste this, decode that. Titan security, okay? So another little note, what do you know? More base 64. This guy is, doesn't wanna make it easy for us. Decode that. I hope you you hope you're an employee. And then what do you know? More base 64. So we're going to copy that and we're going to paste and then we're going to decode. Now we get something different. We get a little interesting thing here, which appears to be a slash, um, explicitive, and then dot text. So this tells me this is, you know, again, when you know, when you start doing these enough, you, you can kind of spot things and go, okay, I know, I know what this is trying to understand. Um, and I know where this is alluding to and things like that. So before I get to that, there's a question. I understand it's something like uh, CTF like, but does something like that happen in pen test? Maybe some comments for developers. Yes, so I will state that these boxes, these vulnerable boxes are extremely exaggerated. However, I will say that a lot of the fundamentals do and will cross over into the real world. So while uh, well, I actually have found base 64 in a real website that, in, anyway, aside from edge cases, let's just pretend that instead of this being some base 64 random thing, let's just say that there are actual developer notes that might allude to something else, which does happen, unfortunately. Um, so again, is it base 64 leveraged to encode some secret message? Probably not. But I 100% have seen base 64 leveraged to hide other things. And actually, I was just going to bring up what Char brought up about the uh, the recent, uh, I don't even want to call it an incident, but I guess you could, in the news, where uh, it was found that on, a, on a, an application, some teacher information, specifically social security numbers, were actually in, in just encoded with Base64, which meant that that was shame on the developer or whoever was leading that project to think that that was okay to, to do that. But essentially, at that point, anyone that had stumbled across that could just simply just decoded, regardless of how many times it may have been encoded. Like you can see here, I had to run this through a few times, whether, whether it's one or a thousand, at some point, you're going to eventually get to whatever was possibly being hidden. So again, these boxes are, are vulnerable by nature. Um, they're, I call them like, they're very like um, Disney. They're very, like very dramatic and overblown. Um, so, but at, at the end of the day, the fundamentals though are, are real. The fundamentals, the things that you do are things that you would do in a real engagement or, or real a pen test for application security or um, maybe doing vuln validations for DAS scans, like all the stuff is 100% is legit. Uh, but yeah, very rarely are you gonna come across exact uh, replicas of things like this. Yeah, um, um, I'm gonna add on to a comment that Peter asked. Um, as a formal developer, I'm guilty of putting stuff in the comments, right? It could, it doesn't mean the stuff that you're looking at that, 
that Dante is showing. But things like also like the directory path, uh, you know, it, it could be any kind of information that we could put in comments. Do we remove them? Most likely not. But you might find additional information. It may be critical, may not. I mean, I definitely never put a password or whatnot in there. Yeah, but there are other things that can actually provide you with some good information about the whole layout of your web application. So I just want to stress the point that, oh, was it Char? Somebody says devs are lazy. <laughs> so yeah, they would do whatever, right? You know. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, we do put a lot of stuff in comments that shouldn't be there, um, but we still do. I mean, we means I've still seen devs do that. So, and back to you. Uh, yeah, okay. well, also a good point too that. Is, is that, um, you know, we're for for the most part the priority of de developers usually is in security i mean we're getting there and we're you know it's becoming more and more aware but you have to realize that that their focus is something entirely different than what our focus is definitely so yeah. you you know it's very common to find things in comments comments there typically developers are pushed i mean they're encouraged for comments because one mm -hmm. you need to be able to Exactly. You know, go back through your code and know what the heck is going on right. or someone else can take the project over. So the, the more know. comments, the better. Uh, uh -huh. Unfortunately though, that from a security standpoint, sometimes comments can be, can be bad. So, uh -huh. um, yeah. but in any case, so we found through multiple passes of doing base 64, we finally landed here, which at this, again, uh, I've done enough of these at some point, you'll just look at this and go, okay, I'm, this is probably part of the URL path. And I just need to add that to see what happens. So we, paste it in, we go there, and then we see this. To the untrained eye, or probably even to the trained eye, you look at this and go like, this is gibberish. Um, I've seen this before, so I already kind of knew what to Google search, and it's Google. Um, but for those of you that don't know, you could probably still figure it out doing some Google searches, like maybe you just, like, uh, you know, I don't know, decode a bunch of pluses, or take a snippet and de decode plus dot plus. Um, there's, there is some... Uh, Morse code uh, ciphers that kind of look like this, but I knew this wasn't that. So basically, you know, a very quick Google search would yield what what this actually is. So again, the untrained eye, you might look at this and go, I have no idea what this is. This is garbage, whatever, and move on. Unfortunately, this is a key <laughs> in, in solving this. So if you just, if you missed this or passed it, <clears throat> you're going to probably have a rough time moving forward. Um, so again, going back to my notes, right? We, we, did the decode, we got here. Um, I pasted this in here, just again, notes, we got all this stuff. Um, and essentially this is, I don't wanna say it, it's a bad word, right? I'm not supposed to say bad words, <laughs> but this is the, uh, the language or the, the cipher that is being used here. This here is what this is. So there's a way to decode this. And uh, I'm a fan of this application, this website here, because it, um, it, uh, it has a lot of different ciphers. And you can see, I think mine's still pasted in here. It has a lot of different ciphers um, that it will decode for you. So you can essentially copy what was in that page, the copy the contents here. Um, and then uh, I need to move this, paste it into here. And then once you decipher it, you get this thing. It kind of spills over, bad formatting. But this is this isn't what's really important here. What's important here is if you scroll down, this is literally still part of the the decipher. This is what's important. Again, it looks like another path, and we can see here from my notes, the same thing. I just copied and pasted that out of there. I once it was decipher, once it decodes to this, basically this little message from whoever this is. Scroll down. So these pounds were part of it. Uh, those hashes, whatever you want to call them, and then you're presented with this. Same thing. So you can see here we're on a little bit like a like an Easter egg hunt, right? And a lot of these challenges are like that. The whole goal is to find the breadcrumbs and solve the puzzle. And in this case, we know that we're looking for flags. Typically, um, the flags exist on the server. We have yet to get onto the server. Right now, we're just browsing. We're just sort of browsing this non-existent website that we found uh, that we found here, and we're just trying to figure out like, well, how how do we how do we go from look, looking at this? To actually being users on the actual server. Um, so that's that's our goal. That's what we're getting to. Um, any case, so we have this here. We can see it decodes to this. So basically rinse and repeat, right? Um, I'm gonna come over to here, uh, put this in the path. And now we're presented with a QR code. 
so this got a little interesting. It's like, okay, so break out my QR app on my phone, <laughs> took a picture of it. And oh, then you have to use your phone. <laughs> yeah. I took a picture yeah. of it and then it decodes it. And essentially and this was, this was a little, I've seen these before in, in some really? uh, other CTFs, uh-huh. um, which was, uh, I haven't seen many of these on Volnhub boxes. Yeah. So this is a cool little sort of surprise. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Uh-huh. Uh, but in any case, just to save anyone from trouble, if you have a QR reader, I think there's also a place where you can save it and then upload it, and it will tell you the contents or send you wherever. But basically, this QR code forwards to this Imgur. So it forwards to this. If you were to have a QR reader on any device and you mm-hmm. took a picture of it, it would mm-hmm. forward you to this website, which uh, we have another image here. Okay which is Drifting Blues. So we know that we're, we landed in the right spot because we know we're doing the Drifting Blues box. And then it's an image. And then basically we, we have this here. We have deer, like, like to, to whom it may concern, what appear to be names, and then please fix our website soon. So we have what look like legible names and then blobbed out or blurred out names. Right off the bat, I'm thinking, okay, cool. I got a list of usernames now. So we're making, we're making some progress here. So what do I do? Again, just notes. You got to do it. Uh, I copied the screenshot, but I also basically, it says it looks like we found some users. And then I paste, I just copied them in the order that I saw them. I don't know what they mean. I don't know what they're to. Um, and I can't really do anything with these blurred ones. Sure, you could maybe put it in Photoshop, try to unblur. Um, I didn't even bother with that because I didn't feel that that was going to be necessary. But uh, you never know. We literally don't know. Everything is like a hint. I always, and I say this over and over again. This is like an escape room. You have no idea what is, <laughs> what's real, what's not, what's part of the challenge, which isn't mm-hmm. part of the challenge, mm-hmm. what's just there to be there. We, yeah. we, we literally, we don't know. Um, um, Dante, could I interrupt you just because I think not only I have this question, um, but I think attendees may have the question. You know, you were showing, you were doing this um, thing. What did you do that turns out to be whole bunch of there's a a a one paragraph yeah this one Mm -hmm. exactly and then you were saying looking at the bottom which pointing to that the the picture file the pin file right which is the qr code now now can you go down a little bit go down okay now um more okay so that's what i'm saying is you go to this website now it says all those things that were hacked and whatnot um, but the, the most important thing, we have to look the whole thing, right? I mean, I probably would have missed out the bottom the, that points to the image file, right? Well, I mean, well, here, here's, here's the thing, though. So th- mm-hmm. that's from my notes. So as we see here on the, on the page, yes. um, uh, on, on the page, that, there's, this is where it ends. Correct. But then you use this, you, you put it into that other website, whatever that language Thing, right. right to decode yeah. it yes. but even with that i mean you you have to go down the entire list oh yeah right? yeah if you, if you didn't know any better you might yeah, just, you, you, just you might ignore here. these pounds or, or right. you're saying, okay i'm looking at this what does this mean right and then and then just look at that and go right. okay I, so it's just I a mean, message and, and just a on. message now go do a rabbit hole right go down to a rabbit right. hole looking for something yeah. but actually the real real thing is the bottom one that's pointing to the qr code or yeah whatnot. okay i just want to point point that out because I personally usually, you know, I'm, I'm not as very focused sometimes. So I'm just thinking, oh, that must be the thing I should go after. Right? Yeah. This one. So it's yeah, it's tough too. plus anytime you're given an image, the image itself could have things embedded. It, it's, uh, you know, that, that's oh. why I always say these are mm-hmm. these are fun and frustrating at the same time, because <laughs> everything, everything is on the table. Every single little thing. You just have yeah. no idea of the author. You have uh-huh. no idea what, what their mindset is. You have no idea. It's like I said, uh-huh. it's literally a, trying to solve a puzzle in the dark. Um, right. Now, the thing that, you know, once you do a lot of these, you'll start getting habits, good or bad. You'll start knowing some places. You'll have gut instincts. Also, in this case, this author, I've already done three other boxes. So there's already a little patterns in itself of how the author generally, you know, creates boxes and picking up on the breadcrumbs, right? Because they're trying to give you hints. And, and it's that fine line between enough hints that can mm-hmm. get you to the finish line, but not too many that make it super easy mm-hmm. to, to solve. 
definitely. Uh, and again, yeah. this is sort of a weird one. I, the major, like a lot of the ones that I'll do are, are le like legitimate websites that actually have functionality and then you uh -huh. can exploit them through, you know, a vulner vulnerable in the framework of like a WordPress site or you're going to brute force mm -hmm. or, you know, it's a, a Joomla or some CMS that has a flaw in a plugin. Uh, you know, a lot of them have actual like hacking, as I say, uh -huh. as opposed to puzzle challenges. Um, we will do a, a little bit of hacking, but it's, this is sort of like a, a mix. And again, it's, you know, it's just, it's a spectrum. Um, so in any case, so we got the QR, we got the list of users. Uh, and again, um, we got the list of users from the QR code from this, this image here that it, that it brought us to. And so basically what I did was just create uh, a user list. You can see here, it just has those names in it. So I spent, quite a bit more time now, once I got the user list, I'm thinking of, okay, <clears throat> where are these users? So I'm thinking, I'm still thinking I'm gonna find a website with like a login. So I run Nick2. Nick2 is just, again, without getting too much into a lot of these tools, you can look them up. Nick2 is like an application that can try and scan a web server to try and find vulnerabilities. No luck there. I ran Derb. Derb is like a directory traversal, um, I don't know, uh, application that tries to find other URLs on the application, right? Because when we went there, remember, um, when we go there, this is this is all we see, right? The only way I know those other two uh, URLs existed was because of those little hints. But I don't know if there's like a login somewhere or some other a whole website hiding under here. I don't have any. There's no menu. There's no link. I don't know what exists underneath of this. So Derb is a very common tool that one will use um, to try and enumerate stuff. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on all the stuff that I tried that didn't work, but uh, I feel that it's it's relevant because I did spend some time after I got the user list of like, okay, my mind said, let's find the website that we're going to supposed to, that we're going to try and log into. Now we don't have passwords, but we have password lists that come in Cali, which we'll get to. Um, so I tried Derb, didn't find anything. I tried WhatWeb um, and just enumerates like the the tech stack of the web application. Well, not much here that I didn't already know. Um, and then I tried GoBuster, which is kind of like Derb, um, a little bit different, maybe a little more quicker, works off the same word list. And again, this just tries just different URLs. It tries, you know, site.com slash, you know, uh, admin slash login slash home. Slash, it just tries a list of, of various things and then sees what the responses are. And if anything is a 200, it usually means, hey, that, that page is probably there. Anything else is that page probably isn't there. Uh, I also tried adding a vhost for it. Again, nothing. So I, these are all the things that I kept trying to enumerate the website with and got back, I got nowhere. So then I went back to my in map and said, okay, I may have exhausted port 80. What else are we gonna try? So that's when I went back to the port 21. Now, again, as we as we noticed before, uh, Char said right off the bat, hey, I would probably try 21. So he, he would probably already have a couple hours head start, <laughs> uh, possibly. But again, the, the thing is, is that we wouldn't have usernames if we didn't go the route 80 first. So it, it, there's not a right or wrong way. It's just, you just you gotta try everything. Uh, and you gotta go down all the rabbit holes because you never know, you might have to get to the bottom of that hole before you have to back all the way out and try a whole another hole um, for lack of better analogies. Um, so in any case, so I, I, I personally felt after some time, I uh, exhausted, uh, my uh, port 80. Um, and uh, I'm looking in the chat here. So uh, if we go back to GoBuster and we look at hosts and things like that. So originally when I ran GoBuster and these are things you, you might pick up. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on, on the things that I tried that didn't work. But uh, a lot of times you might, you might need to add the host name to your attacks to possibly yield, yield better results. So I modified my host file, which you can see here. Uh, wait, wait. Is it, is it, uh... So you can see here that I uh, uh, appended this host to this IP address, right? This is our target and I appended this. So essentially I can just go to driftingblues.box and it, and it will resolve to this IP address. And sometimes you need to do that, especially if you're trying to enumerate the vhost or like a subdomain. The vhost GoBuster basically says, okay, I'm gonna try 
like, you know, and the normal derb or go buster, we, we're trying paths. We're trying IP address dot, like IP address slash something. Or maybe I, I um, append the host file and we try like drifting blues box dot something. Um, but for a V hosts, we're looking at like a, a prepend of the dot com. We're looking at like admin dot something or test dot something. So you can see here, once I added the V host or, or once I added the host to my Etsy file or host file and then ran the V host attack inside of GoBuster, you can see here that now it, it's testing for these things. Again, at the end of the day, I don't know what's on this box. I don't know what's running. I don't know what's where. You have to try everything because you never know where the author puts something. He, they could be a subdomain running mail dot something or WordPress dot something. In this case, it's testing all of these and it didn't find anything. And how I know that is because of these status is 400s. In the web oh. world, I, I want a 200. That tells me like, this is a, this is a good result. I, got, I, didn't, I didn't see any 200s. So again, it was a dead end. So Dante, I'm gonna interrupt you for uh, another minute. Um, so you're, you were saying that um, the first thing you did was going through the IP, whatever, the URL. Then you said for vhost, you need to modify the SC slash host, make it, you know, in this case, you call drip, drifting through dot box. If you didn't do that, you're saying you wouldn't be able to see the other things that, the other thing that you just did, the other screen, whatever, the list of the admin. Yeah, the if I didn't do that, I, mm -hmm. it, it uh, it would be very difficult for um, for GoBuster mm. to enumerate these uh, v, these vhosts or subdomains, uh, whatever you call them. I yeah, see. so so I get into the habit of first just or I just okay. check uh, because mm -hmm. I'm doing like derb via the IP address. I'll typically mm -hmm. kick both of these off, mm -hmm. see what happens, and then I might go, okay, well let me just try adding the the host file uh, to see if I get. And sometimes I'll go back and run them again. Yeah. Um, like I think I, here on my GoBuster, I actually, you can see uh -huh. here, I did it just with the IP address and found nothing. So then I was like, okay, let's, mm. let's modify the host file and then run it again, mm. because sometimes I'll get better results with GoBuster after adding uh, the domain. And then you can see uh. here pretty much the same results. But once I did that, then my next uh -huh. step, again, habits, whether they're good or bad, then I'll check the vhosts now, because now that I've uh -huh. added the, the, the Etsy, the host file, uh -huh. um, and I got no results here. I just basically go to the next thing and say, okay, let's just try, you know, this now that I got that added, it can hopefully find things better, run it right. through the list. Uh, sometimes we get results back on, a, I think on a, on a previous box of one of these, I don't remember which one, one or two uh -huh. or whatever there, we did get results back. And that was part of the challenge. Uh, in this instance, it looks like you know, he, the author has moved on to make it a little bit more, more challenging uh -huh. and not, uh, have this be like a potential way in so yeah okay thanks uh, that explains because i didn't know what was the advantage of i mean i saw the results right you, you got more stuff right even though they're not useful to you from the right um, because you never know like Go what Buster. what mm -hmm. may be there until you try and there's a comment in the chat about ssh and about yeah uh, passwords there's 100 mm -hmm. uh exactly that that once you get a list of usernames you start figuring out well where am I going to use those? And right here, we have kind of three options. We have, we keep hunting for a website where maybe there's a login um, or maybe there's an FTP that we can log into, or maybe we're logging into SSH. Now, again, just the way I happen to my workflow, I went from here to the top. So I went to, to 21. So I initially, I'm thinking, okay, maybe we can try to see if any of these work um, with the FTP. Um, or check anonymous to see if we can all log in. But I, I'm just like, I have a list of users. We're going to try that uh, quickly. Um, there's a lot of different tools that you can use uh, to try and enumerate or brute force <clears throat> FTP. My first go-to is usually Metasploit. Um, there, is a, there is an FTP login check where essentially you have to give it a username or list and or password or list. Um, I tried that for whatever reason. It did not have a uh, it wasn't successful. It, it, it actually kept timing out um, and it, it kept thinking that the application was offline. So I was like, okay, well, let's scratch this and let's move to a different one. Another good, um, another one that I use a lot is uh, Hydra. Um, so basically um, you, you kind of are, see where I got there, but we'll, we'll run this so you can see it kind of what it, in real time, what it looks like. But just again, there are a lot of brute forcing tools out there. Um, getting a username is half the battle, but that's that's 50% more than we had before. So we know we have a list of usernames, but we don't know what they belong to. I felt that I had exhausted port 80. So I felt like 
there was nothing else to really go over for the web stuff. And I just happened to pick the FTP over, I saw port 21 open and we got that from our very first enumeration to see that those three ports were open, port 21 being one of them. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to make a list. And from the list, uh, I'm just going to put those users in there, which is what I did. Literally, I just made a list and added those four users. So we got list list of usernames, check. Passwords, uh, partially checked, right? That, I couldn't find any on the application. The website didn't give me any. So, but Kali comes with a plethora of word lists, but the most uh, common one is the Rocky list. That is by, by far the most popular, probably password list, even outside of Kali, but it does come with every Kali installation. And for those of you who don't know, a word list or password list is just literally, it is what it sounds like, it is a massive list of passwords that have been shared and accumulated and found. Um, and that basically you try and leverage that uh, against a brute force. So a brute force is you need a password, you need a username and a password to get in. We have four usernames and the Rocky list has, I've, I forget what, like 13 million passwords, um, like legitimate passwords. It's not trying to, to make passwords and guess, the Rocky list is a list of actual passwords. So I'm gonna feed that into Hydra and I'm gonna tell Hydra basically, hey, use this user list um, and use this password list and see if you can do anything. See if you can, if, if we get a match or if, if, uh, if we can log in. So a brute force isn't like breaking something or subverting something, it's literally just trying different username, password combinations um, to see if any of them work, if, if we actually log in. So we can see here, I'm calling uh, the users. This little dash U in Hydra world is, uh, it hops around from user to user. So we have, remember those four users? Instead of trying 13 million or whatever passwords on the first user before then going to the second user, um, it, uh, it loops through them. So it basically goes to the first user, and then tries the password in the list. And then goes to the second user and tries the password. And goes to the third user, tries the as opposed to the first user, let's iterate through all 13 million, exhaust that list. Okay, now let's get to the second user and then exhaust that list. And then let's go to the third. So it sort of does this hopping on the users. At the end of the day, the time will be this, will take the same sort of, um, but it's just a little bit more efficient of possibly trying different users woven. Again, as opposed to, running through one user and then running through another. Because at the end of the day, I don't know, I'm guessing here, I don't know if any of these users are for FTP. And if they are, I don't know if any of the passwords are in RockU. And if they are, I don't know which user has a password that's in this list. So it's literally just you know a guessing game at this point. Uh, the V is verbose, which is good. Again, I'm a huge fan of that. I like to see stuff doing things instead of just hitting enter and just seeing a cursor there sit for minutes, hours, days, you, just, you, don't, you don't know. Um, and the F, oh, I think the F is, um, basically stop once it finds, as opposed to like logging it in the log, the Hydra log, and then you got to go back through it and then look. Um, I think the F is like finish on find or something. And the L is a user list. It's, we're saying Hydra use this. And then we're saying P for the password list. We're saying, Hey, use this. And they were given it the target. Uh, the last time I timed this, it took about. 10 minutes. So we're probably not going to wait for the whole thing, but um, you can see here that it's skipping around users, right? It doesn't say uh, Luther or whatever the first user is. And it doesn't say like Luther for everything and then trying these. It's literally jumping between different users. And then you can kind of see when it pauses for a second, you can see the, the passwords that it's trying. And these passwords are in that uh, Rocky list. Um, it took about 10 minutes before it got the hit. Um, we'll wait, we'll let it run for a little bit, but we can kind of jump forward and let it run. But I think this is a good time to pause. Do we have any, do we have any questions? Is anyone hacking along? Um, I can, I can go back and review something, uh, while we're kind of waiting for this, but like I said, I'm not going to wait for this whole thing, but if we have some questions now would be a good time to, to field them. Yeah, I have a question i have been asked and I didn't have an answer. Okay. Um, what if you run this nothing came back, the Rocky list, right? You go through this. So what's your next step? My next that step. List, my, that list is supposed to be an awesome one, right? I mean, yes, it's very, it's very, 
Yeah, it's very mm-hmm. common. Now, depending on the situation would be my next steps. Now, in a, in a CTF style or a Vuln Hub box, I would try, I would just try another list. Personally, I would just basically, uh, okay, mm-hmm. um, I know that, and, and again, and I would try another list that's probably in Cali because again, a lot of these boxes are, sure, you can see here, like, you know, there was a QR thing I had to do, but the majority of these challenges on these mm-hmm. Vuln Hub boxes are tools that you would use that are already inside of Cali. Like I haven't done a challenge yet where I've needed to, buy something or get some <laughs> proprietary thing to solve. It's like most of the people building these boxes mm-hmm. are building them with some sort of a pen testing operating system in mind. And as of the moment, Cali uh-huh. is sort of still probably the, you know, one of the popular ones outside of, mm. you know, black arch or whatever, or um, parrot and whatever, all the other, you know, ones are out there. I'm old school. Mm-hmm. So I use Cali, but mm-hmm. Um, I would, I would, if this was exhausted, I would either uh-huh. hit hunt for more usernames or I would mm-hmm. probably choose another list that is inside of um, Cali. But I, w- I will say that it's very rare that nine times out of 10 on these uh-huh. challenges, uh-huh. if it's not on the Rocky, Rocky list, uh-huh. you either have to make it with, from the contents using other applications in Cali uh-huh. um, to make a password list, or this isn't the right way. Okay, I got that, but I also have a question. Why? When I noticed on that thing that it shows up the username, there were two that got blurred. What does that mean? Does that mean there were two additional usernames that? Well, that means we're not trying them, right? Because your user. Yeah, and really, we don't. And and really, to be honest, we don't know what that means. We don't know if uh-huh. are those two users in if there's that was an image. We don't know. If are those two users some like we need to do some sort of data exfiltration and and uh, in, in the image itself and find them or do we need to use Photoshop to again a lot of uh, times uh-huh. there, again you have to also know like the 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 little intricacies of a lot of these challenges and sometimes for the majority of the time it's basically whatever is in Cali is going to be probably needed and, and used to solve it but uh-huh. that's not always the case but again because we don't know and it's like everything is on the table. You know, uh, hindsight could be, oh, well, maybe I needed to try and use an uh, image program to unblur those two users. Or oh. maybe there's maybe that was a hint to tell me there's two users somewhere else mm-hmm. and these four aren't going to yield anything. But yeah. my first my first gut reaction when I came across that was, OK, here's four users. Let me start trying them. Mm. If, yeah. if I if if this list exhausted and out of four mm-hmm. users and mm-hmm. I tried another list and that exhausted, mm-hmm. then I might go back to. Well, one, does it maybe work for the, S- the SSH login? But before that, um, maybe go back to the image yeah. and see if there's a way to find those two users. Or mm-hmm. was this a hint to tell me there's two users somewhere else in the application or on a website or in a hidden URL? And one of those two users is, you know, is, is going to get me somewhere. So really, mm-hmm. again, at the end of the day, that's why these are so much fun. But at the same time, they can be very frustrating because right. you, you literally you don't know. You're having to guess what what the next step is and even outside of the what the next step is then how do you execute the next step you know it's like okay if i know the next step is to maybe try and break into the ftp okay that's like the theoretical side of what i need to do next but then it's like there's the how always associated with the next step how do i try and brute force ftp do i Mm -hmm. do i write my own script with python maybe Mm. or do i leverage what you know with something that's already out there like like metasploit or Hydra or any other brute forcing, you know, types of applications. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just it, it's it can it be never ending. Yeah, it does take a long time. So Peter said it takes a long time. <laughs> to, yeah, and, and again, it depends. It depends on your word list. It depends on how many users you could get lucky. It could be mm-hmm. that maybe if I didn't use this user skip thing, maybe the first username of Luther, I think maybe that maybe that would have found it, but I, it. You just literally don't know until you start experimenting with, with different things um, and different word lists and different applications that are leveraging some are faster than others. Unfortunately, Metasploit is on um, the little bit of, for this particular type of attack is on the slower side. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So it could literally take, usually if I don't get a result in like a day or so, I, <laughs> I'm like, this probably isn't the, what the author, I don't think right. the author would have wanted me to sit around for, uh-huh. a day or two just letting this run <laughs> right. so that's when i start questioning is this the right you know but workflow yeah hey dante hey hey so um so the good news 
is that uh, for every login I have, I, I use a different password. <laughs> so that's good. But, but the bad news is I've seen all my passwords float by. Full fly. <laughs> oh, my God. In the last five minutes. That's Are hilarious. You, I know. I asked no, you the, um, when oh, I first heard of the. Which one did you use? No, just kidding. <laughs> When I first heard of the Rocky List, actually, one of the first things I did was, and I forget the Linux command, and I have it somewhere, but I, I, I essentially, there's a, a command you can run in Linux to, to like, uh, check if your text exists in the list. And sure enough, Down uh, the river. and this is like, this is years and years and years ago, but sure enough, my password was in the list. And that's when I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should I probably wanted, change it. I wanted to share you a, a real story. So I took my first ethical hacking course from a local community college. So the, their instructor the professor said, well, you guys, let's hack your own password, running John the Ripper, right? And I'm, I was going, no way. Mine wasn't, you know, that strong, but wasn't that easy. You know what? Within, <laughs> within like a one minute. <laughs> it got my password. I almost fell on my floor. It, it, it was like from that moment on, I really was hooked on you know the hacking stuff. I mean, in terms of working for security, but really, it was like I totally just shocked. How could an open source software like just know my stuff? <laughs> you know. So, but back to you. I know, and um, Dennis, you know, you saw your password here, so I'm not surprised, right? <laughs> But that was that was just funny, you know, because I, I always remember that was like, wow, my password was just showing right in front of me, right? By running yeah, yeah, I yeah, know it's it's definitely like it can be a wake up call, you know. There's that the app, the, the website out there that have I been pwned and the Rocky list <laughs> oh, just for, for for quick context, <laughs> oh. the Rocky list from what I remember uh-huh. was from the from MySpace hack. I, I forget the the exact details, but I think Rocky was like a, a plugin or an implementation of something that was like hooked into or part of MySpace. Um, I, I could, I could swear. I know they had like a, an image gallery app where you can upload a bunch of images, add some music, but I think it was, it was attached somehow to MySpace in the sense that when rock you, that, uh-huh. um, that third party got, got hacked, uh-huh. they were able to exfiltrate all of MySpace users. And again, MySpace is, you know, super old. Um, but they, but they were able to gain access to all the passwords for all the users. And that's, you know, at that time there was like 13 million or whatever. So that's mm-hmm. where this list came from. So that kind of gives you an idea of like how, like the, like the, the dating of how old this sort of list is. And it's <laughs> uh, been, you know, things have been added to it on and off, but um, it was such a popular list and it's still in circulation that it's just part of Cali and just a very common yeah. list. Um, mm-hmm. But that's why it's called Rock You. Um, it's it, there's, there's a reason you know there's a, there's a reason Whoa, for that peter just put something on there huh? is hubert one of their uh, he, he users? just he he told the future so you can see he had posted wow, uh, peter, but you can see here, uh-huh. see here after you know 10 minutes ish ish um oh. it found a matching uh, mm. matching set of usernames so basically when it came across this name with this password it, it was able to to log in via the ftp mm. so that's basically kind of like what it did and it stopped as opposed to just seeing like the like this, uh, I don't know, turquoise flyby, and then you know go back and look at the logs. Right, so and so it's good. part of part of that flag that I used, you know, in the beginning. In any case, so this is good. So now we're fairly certain that we're kind of on track, uh, and that now we know for a fact that Hubert and with John three sixteen can get us into FTP. Again, we don't know where this is going to go or if this is even part of the challenge, but. It, it's a breadcrumb that we're going to definitely um, continue to visit. So with that said, you can see here, I have this and basically we're going to, you know, we're going to now log into um, the FTP. So wow. let me pick one that I want to log time. into. Hmm. Would it work? Hmm. So let me, <laughs> I'm, I'm foreshadowing what I know, what I know, I'm trying to set up, set this up, uh, what I know that I need to do here in a minute to make it the easiest way. So let me, um, let me, uh, figure out, I want to go to write-ups. Oops. And I want to go into my phone hub. Are you guys excited? This might be the time moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you guys. This is uh, fun, right? <laughs> Let's see. And I'm just, I'm taking this slow approach just so everyone can kind of see like what, what it is I'm doing, where I'm going. It'll, it'll make sense in a minute as to why I'm going there. Um, um, so 
you can see here, this is the directory that I'm in over here on the left, but again, I'm just kind of doing this on the right because well, you'll, you'll see why later it makes sense just for workflow. Um, so on this right screen, uh, this is where we're gonna FTP from. So we're gonna FTP, you can see that I've done this in the past, but essentially for FTP, you do the, 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 the target, in this case, it's an IP address, uh, and then the port number, which generally is gonna be 21 for FTP. And we're gonna cross our fingers that that, that uh, Hydra was correct in its assumption that, that that username password combination is going to work for uh, Hubert on the FTP. John 316. Boom, what do you know? So we got really lucky. Hydra was able to find wow. the <laughs> username password combination for Hubert uh -huh. to get into FTP. Um, so now we just try and figure out like, like I don't know, like, Walk around. What, where where are we at? What, where what can where can we go? What 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 do we see? Again, we have no idea. Is this is there going to be something here? And another part of an Easter egg or a breadcrumb or a dead end? We we literally have no idea. Um, so from here, the goal, right? We're kind of on the box, right? The, the whole purpose is typically to get into or onto the box and then find some flags. Um, so. We're kind of on the box, we FTP'd in. I mean, we don't really have like much privileges or anything like that, but we're sort of on the box in a, in a way. So this is good, this, this is definitely like a good foothold. You know, I mean, typically with FTP rights, I mean, you can usually, you know, move stuff around. So if this was a real world scenario, there are like, this would already be very usually disastrous for this application. The fact that we have FTP'd into it, um, into wherever we are, and then could do who knows what with uploading shells, backdoors, malware, anything, you name it, you know, we could possibly start putting stuff here. Um, but for our intense purposes, we're trying to find, you know, flags. Um, so for here, right, we saw a folder for Hubert. So we're probably pretty sure he's got like a home folder in on this Linux system somewhere. Um, and typically with FTP, you're, you know, you're either like locked into a directory or your your the permissions you have uh, don't enable you to see everything. So you're kind of running blindly. Um, but at least we know that there is a folder for Hubert, which was makes sense. Uh, that was that was one of the username and passwords we found. Um, and he does appear to have a folder here. And basically the next steps would be, okay, well, how do we leverage this to, to gain further access? This is where it gets a little tricky um, and took quite a bit of time to do. But again, you start doing these enough, you you take enough notes, uh, it's fairly easy to sort of replicate some of the stuff uh, without having to try too much out of memory or, or Googling. But ideally, and it's, this is a very, very common practice, is what we're going to see if maybe we can, we don't have SSH creds, but we're going to see if we can uh, create some keys that we can then leverage to SSH into the box as as Hubert. Right now, we're, we're FTP'd in as him. Um, there's not a lot we can do. There's not, there's we're literally locked into this very, very, very small area um, of things that we can do. And I'm sure a lot of you here in this channel may have uh, thousands of ideas that you can that you can do and where you would go and things that you would look at. Um, and we can definitely discuss those uh, after the fact. But for now, I'm just going to sort of go through the, the first things that come to my mind and the things that I tried that, that worked. Um, so from here, my goal is I'm going to try and put some keys uh, I'm going to generate SSH keys, and then I'm going to drop them here, and then I should be able to uh, connect to, I should be able to SSH without any passwords. I know before there was a, a mention of you got usernames, maybe you can brute force SSH, possibly. I, I didn't even bother to try because it turned out I, I, it wasn't necessary, but that doesn't mean that there aren't multiple ways that you can solve boxes. I know for a fact there are typically sometimes multiple ways, whether it was intended or not, to where you solve it one way, someone else may have solved it another way. Um, so that could be very well the case and maybe, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, so for me, I'm thinking, okay, let's try and put some keys in here so I can SSH and then actually get onto the server from an SSH standpoint and then move around, see folders, files. Cause at the end of the day, I know I'm looking for two flags and I'm fairly certain I'm, I know that I'm looking for two flags because the previous three boxes from this author in this series were two flags. One flag is like a user which I'm, I'm really leaning towards Hubert being that user, and then one flag being root. 
So I know at some point I got to try to figure out how to elevate from Hubert uh, and his privileges to root privileges. And for those that have watched uh, the third box for this, um, you'll see the that um, uh, a, a repeating attack or uh, a way to escalate set privileges that was done in the previous one. So for now, we got to figure out those keys, right? So for me, the first thing I did was right use SSH gen to generate some keys. Um, and specifically, I, just to make things easy when you start moving things around from place to place, it's important to try and keep things in certain locations, which you'll find out why in a minute. Um, so I'm going to run this SSH key gen, but when it comes to the location, I'm actually going to put it um, here instead of, of like a root place or like my home place. Um, and you'll, 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 see, you'll see why in a second. Um, so, but before I do that, I have to actually create the, uh, I don't have a, a .SSH. I did, I deleted it. I actually deleted all my, well, not all, but I deleted all the stuff I had done. So it wasn't already like on the box and you'll see all the stuff and, and all that stuff. So, um, but for now we can see here, uh, we're just going to um, do a, create the uh, dot uh, SSH. We're gonna try and we're gonna create the uh, SSH folder so we can then put the, the, uh, uh, the keys that we're going to generate um, inside there and again, here in a second, but give me one second. Let me just make some room here. One second. While we're doing that, any questions so far? On anything? You know, Dante, you sounded like you were far away just about a second ago. Did you move away from the mic? Oh, no, I was probably just talking quiet or something. Oh, OK. All right. You're, you're back. Um, so yeah, so any so I just got to I got to take care of something on this other screen real quick. Um, any questions? Uh, so I'm just summarizing the steps to make sure I'm doing it right. Um, so we generate the SSH keys on the Kali box and then um, just change the permissions. Yes, that, that's the half of it. Yep. And then from there, then we can try and put them uh, the public onto the target box. Um, so, but like I said, because of where I'm going to put this, um, this path doesn't exist yet technically, this, this .ssh. So um, we can just basically touch um, uh, right and then CD. Oh, shoot. I did the, uh, no, I didn't want to touch that. Um, Oops. One second here. But yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll basically get these keys generated here, and then from there, we'll try and figure out a way. Which, funny enough, took me way longer than it needed to uh, to to get the the file onto the the target. Um, Okay, so where were we? So, yes. Okay, so first we need to make the directory for our SSH to go into. Um, so we're just gonna, and now we can see here that we have our uh, .ssh, and we're gonna go into there for a second. You see, there's nothing there. Um, and going back to the, the generating the keys, it's fairly simple. It's fairly straightforward. Again, and we're going to just use default settings. The only thing I'm changing is just the path, which again, it'll make sense in a minute. Um, but this is basically the command. Typically, you can just, just keep clicking enter or hitting enter through it, and it, it'll do what it needs to do. But again, we're just going to do a slight modification, uh, which will make sense here in a second. So I'm just going to do this. And basically, it's going to say where. So I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm going to put it there, which is basically kind of where we are. And then I'm just going to press enter. Press enter. <clears throat> and wait, did it? Didn't do it. What did it? Did it fail? Hmm. 
Uh, it says there's no such directory IDRSA under dot SSH. What? No, it's well, it's putting it. It's putting it here. Uh, oh, drifting. And I'm in for so I'm here. I'm here. Can you oh, hold just on. verify you have that directory under the slash the count? Yeah, no, I think I hold on. I think maybe this. You copy right. it to your own write up directory, right? Or something. Yeah, yeah. This this is right. This should be right. I'll try that again. And I know I have the okay, so it's saying where are we going to put this? And you can I just, put it in a different directory. Right? Yeah, yeah. Could the the in, in your normal like by default there's already this dot SSH in home Cali. Um, but because I'm doing it out of here, which will make sense in a, in a minute, again, sort of pre-planning and looking looking back like hindsight, how to do things maybe a little bit more efficiently when we're moving files around, because we want to be in those directories when we connect to the, the target and to make just make things easy or even possible. Um, so this should be home Cali documents right up to me. My question, do you have a dot SSH directory in that direct in that this new thing? Yeah, I mean it's yeah, right here. That's under the write-up. Oh yeah. Oh, there we go. For some reason, okay. I think maybe I had pasted something wrong. So now, so this this is what it what it looks like if it's done correctly. You'll see here that it puts um, two files in there. So, oops. um, let's see that it puts the, the RSA and the RSA pub. So we created the we created keys that are going to allow us to. We're going to attempt to SSH, right? We don't have SSH creds. Um, so we were able to FTP, though, and we we're able to basically log in as Hubert. Um, and we can, we saw that Hubert had a folder, and in that folder, there was nothing there. But that doesn't mean we can't put some keys there so that we, when we attempt to now log in from SSH instead of FTP, um, maybe we'll have some results or, and maybe we can possibly get into, um, uh, into SSH as him and then start the sort of the process all over again and maybe, maybe enumerate the boxes, figure out where we are, who we are, what our permissions are, see if we can get a flag and then elevate permissions to get to the, you know, root flag. Um, so from here, this is where things get a little convoluted, but we can see here that we got the keys. Um, we're going to essentially copy the pub into uh, into a new file, and then this is what we're going to try and dump over onto the uh, to the to the, the target box. Um, and the reason why we are going to do certain things the way we do them is because it'll make things easier um, to like copy and paste, sort of, um, or to to move, uh, if you will. So let me. Back and I'm in. I'm out of Drifting Blues four. Okay, so I'm in SSH, right? And I have my um, these guys here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy the uh, pub into a file just called like authorized keys. So you can see here, this is just a simple command. I'm just going to uh, copy it and then. Copy it from, or copy it from the pub to authorized keys, and then now you can see I have the th three files, right? I have the original two that were made, and then I basically just copied this one as authorized keys, because this is basically where where Linux works out of for keys um, to communicate via like SSH when we're logging in. So then the challenge is is now I got to get this authorized keys over to here, but it's not really that big of a challenge because all I had to do is just get this file into this directory over here. And so I know it might sound convoluted in this directory over here is where I'm working out of currently out of the FTP, FTP. So maybe to make it easier, you could just like quit this and then I can just sort of go, um, right, so now I'm in basically these two, I'm in the same place on both of these windows. 
But what I want to do is now, now that I'm in this SSH directory, which is where the uh, authorized keys, where that's where that lives, and it's going to make it's going to make uploading that to the target much easier, which you'll see here in a second. So now I can just FTP again back into the box as Hubert with uh, let me make sure. Oops. John three sixteen connected. See here that uh, we're in that root directory. We want to go into Hubert because remember we're FTP into this, but this is well, we're fairly certain that this is his folder on the on the actual Linux box as a Linux user. That's this is Hubert has a home directory within Linux, um, and inside of that we're given access to it through FTP, but we can't really do much or move around. Um, Char mentioned a few different commands that you could try. Um, so just maybe take note of that. I haven't tried any of those, but for now, um, we're just going to uh, kind of continue on what I did. So now we're, again, we're, we've FTP'd into Hubert. Now we FTP'd from this directory though, from this directory, from my Kali box, we FTP'd from here. Now, the reason why I did that was very specific because now when I want to try and move or, or put those keys, this file here, this authorized keys, it's going to be so much easier because I'm in that directory. So I can just do a very generic, super simple put command um, to put this file over here, where if I had FTP'd from somewhere else, um, the put would, I would have to include that in the file and it might just make the put command a little bit more difficult. Um, so let's see here. Let me go back to right here. You can see here. This is literally what, what all I'll have to run right now because I'm working out of the directory that I FTP'd from. And this file is in this directory. So when I do the put, all I gotta do is just type the file that I'm trying to put. I don't have to do anything weird with the path. So I can just literally just do put and then authorized keys, successful. And we can see now we have our authorized keys file on the target box inside of Hubert's folder. So now, as alluded to before, we can go back, change, do a chamad for our um, our key, hey, and Dante, then yes, you skip this step. What's that? The make dir ssh. Oh yes, thank you for calling that out. Oh, yeah. you mean the over here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very that that would that definitely needs to happen. Um, so as Char was mentioning before, uh, or as you mentioned, we need, uh, I need to be in, I need to move these into here, uh, or I can just go into there and just do the put command again. I think it will still, I think it will still work. Um, uh, but yes, they have to be in the SSH directory for that, for this to work. Um, so now that the keys are in the proper place, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we can kind of basically go back here and we're going to chmod our, well, actually I won't chmod it first and I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like if you don't change the permissions. Um, so before we're about changing permissions, or even if you know that you think you have to change permissions, we can essentially just try an SSH uh, to our target as uh, Hubert. Um, and again, we're out of this SSH file. So we can just basically do... Um, we can use this, right? So we're telling um, we're telling Callie, hey, uh, we're going to SSH to this this thing with this key. And this is the basically the the flag or script for that, the dash i. And sure enough, it logged us in. And sometimes though, you'll get an error because the the permissions for this is set to um, to open. And a lot of times it might complain to say, hey, um, anyone can use this and this should really just be for you and you only. Um, so you, you might need to change the permissions before you're before we're gonna allow this this like handshake to happen. So if you if you get an error like that, just note that a lot of times you might have to do um, a chamad, which I think do I mentioned it here? Yeah, you might have to do like a 400. 
uh, for this to, to work. Sometimes it complains, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why. It's, it seems like it's hit or miss char. Maybe you know, but sometimes it, it, it just logs in and sometimes it doesn't. But if it doesn't and you see that there's an error about permissions, normally just a chamad will fix that right up, try it again, and then sure enough, um, you'll be able to log in. So in this instance, we have made a massive step in uh, most likely finding the first flag. Again, just to do a quick re recap. We found the target via nmap. Once we found the target, we did another nmap to enumerate services running. We found out that there were a couple different services running, specifically 80, 22, and 21. Through 80, we found a website that wasn't complete. And through a little bit more digging, we found essentially a list of usernames. Once we found the usernames, we needed to figure out, well, what are those usernames for? I got lucky in guessing that it was for the FTP. So we used Hydra to use basically brute force those four usernames with the Rocky list to see if we got a match. Sure enough, we did get a match. Um, and that match basically is this Hubert John 316 pass, uh, password. From there, we were able to log in. We FTP'd over here on the right-hand screen. You can see we FTP'd in. We saw a folder for Hubert. In that folder, there was nothing there, but we figured, hey, let's see if we can drop some keys in there and then possibly SSH to it to get a stronger foothold Instead of an FTP, let's see if we can SSH. With SSH, we typically have more freedoms, right? It's like, you know, we're logging into the system. We can move around. We can, you know, go different places. We can see things. We can try and run stuff. Whereas from FTP, we're, we're locked in and we have very, very little room to move or to enter or to do anything. So to, do, to get the keys up there, we created the SSH folder. Uh, on my side, I created the keys. I just copied the, the, the .pub to authorize keys and then move that via the FTP put command, which at this point we could have moved anything over. But our point again is try and get flags, uh, privilege escalation, all that good stuff. So really all I really wanted to do is just get keys over here so I could SSH in. Um, and this was a common technique that, that you'll do on, on some of these boxes. So I felt that I was kind of going in the right direction. So once we got the keys over here, it literally was just a simple command as just SSHing in. Um, and figuring out like, okay, cool, I'm Herbert. Um, no, nothing new there. We can see here, um, how, like we can see here where we were at in the FTP side over here. But again, FTP, we were given very, very strict access, right? I didn't, I don't see these files over here. Um, but, but I was, I sort of landed in the same spot. You can see here, you know, where I put the keys first before Char called out that I didn't make the SSH directory yet. And then I made the SSH directory and then that's where these these keys were put. So, but, uh, and then in, in any case, now I am actually Hubert. Now I've actually SSH'd on into the box. Um, so a massive, massive step. We've gone from outside looking into now we are literally on the server, um, which is a huge feat. So if you made it this far, congratulations. Generally, when you get here, here meaning on the actual server, you, you probably just want to do a quick little inventory of where you are, who you are, um, but most importantly, um, you'll want to go to a home directory for that person, which is where we already landed. And then sure enough, it looks like here, we have this sort of user text, right? Uh, remember, we're looking for flags, if you forgot. <laughs> um, so we're gonna always cat any types of things that we find, any text files we find, we're gonna cat them because a lot of times it could be that flag. And sure enough for us, it is the first flag. And good news is it kind of gives us a little hint of what, well, how many other things to look for. One of two, this is what the flag looks like. The troll guy, maybe it looks like he's getting up this finger. I can't tell, but nonetheless, flag one down. Uh, awesome. So um, as you can see here, flag one. Well, now we got to get to flag two. Flag two is going to be a whole lot harder. And it, and it usually is uh, for good reasons. So remember, typically on these, there's... Privesk is, is part of the challenge. Privesk means privilege escalation, meaning that I'm not going to find the root flag uh, unless I'm root. So I'm not root. Right now I'm a Hubert. So the goal is how do I get from this user? How do I find some flaw in a configuration or an application to get to root user? Um, and again, you know, some of this stuff is exaggerated, but the fundamentals are still there. If this was a real engagement or a pen test or whatever it is, um, the idea is still the same. The idea is how can I possibly elevate my privileges from whatever user I'm given to a higher level of user that has more 
um, privileges or access. So same thing goes here. It's just how we go about doing this is maybe a little bit more uh, dramatic, if you will. But I but we'll talk afterwards is how um, real world misconfigurations can lead to th this, these exact uh, flaws and issues. Um, so one of the things that I typically will do is, you know, first, a very, and again, I'm not going to dig into a lot of the things that I tried that didn't work, but this is a simple command that I try all the time to tell me if I can run any type of pseudo command and then what is the list of things I could possibly do leveraging pseudo. Here it's not found, so that pretty much rules out like a whole lot of things I would normally try. Like there are a, there's a plethora of things that I would start trying here. And the fact that I can't, this, this is already kind of a, a, a dead end in a sense that this is going to limit a lot of the normal things I would try. The next thing that I'll just, I'll bring up that I may not have tried in order, but there's a cool command here um, that I wrote a little script for in the past, but this command here, uh, we're going to run and it's essentially, essentially sort of, it's kind of doing a similar thing where it's going to basically kind of say um, the sticky bit, uh, what applications are typically could be run as root. Um, similar to the sudo dash L, but a, a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, this is another tried and true method or command to run. And in this list that you that you get here, it's very common to leverage other tools to see if there are known misconfigurations with, with these binaries to where you could possibly gain uh, exploit or run some something to modify these or run them as is. Um, to gain root privileges. And so real quick, I'll just mention very quickly on maybe uh, where one would go. This GTFO bins is extremely uh, popular and common to look at said binaries to see if there are any known ways to exploit them for privilege escalation. So essentially what you could do is just go down this list, see if anything in here is over here. And if so, maybe run a command that could possibly elevate your privileges through something. FTP is a common one, uh, NMAP is a common one. You'll notice that none of those are here, but let's just say like um, uh, mount, this is an alphabetical order. I forget if mount is in here or not. Yeah, mount is in here. However, you notice that it, it's attached to sudo. So I could, I, if I could sudo, I could actually leverage the mount binary to possibly get me a bin bash root shell because mount can be run as root, I could possibly leverage that and then exploit. However, I can't do any pseudo commands as we found out when I tried to run this the pseudo L. Um, so that again, takes away a lot of things that, that I won't be able to, that I would normally do. Um, this is where, if you had solved the previous box where this is gonna be like deja vu, um, you'll find that this is like the, where's Waldo? This is the thing that wouldn't normally be here. Um, same as the last box. Um, uh, so I'll, this is going to be the short version of that. But essentially, you get through this list and you realize like, hmm, this isn't really something that is a part of a normal process. Um, so you run it. And you realize that it's a custom script. Custom scripts exist all the time. Admins use them maybe to automate some stuff. This particular custom script appears that it's running three things, that it's running an I, IP sort of look up of its own, giving me a list of the hosts that are on this box. And then doing maybe uh, some sort of uname or something to get a little bit of information. So this is a custom script that's called get info. It isn't normally here. Um, and you'll know that as you do these or just know like what typically you would find on a box. Um, plus I've never seen this before in my life outside of the box before this one. So um, yeah, custom script that's doing this thing. So it's calling these three different things. So um, I don't want to say a common method, but a method, and because again, because it's in this list, we know that uh, we can possibly leverage this um, to gain uh, possible root privileges because anything in this list can kind of is technically can be run as root or will run under root. Um, but we're not, we're, we're Hubert, but maybe we can hijack one of these commands to elevate our privilege because these can run as root. So this is where, again, it's it gets complicated. So to call this box easy, I think, is a disservice. Um, but in any case, we are going to hijack the command that's being run 
it's calling IP, specifically IP and then address. IP is a command, and then there's something appended after it that does a certain thing from the IP binary, if you will. But in any case, we can try and hijack IP. So instead of it calling the address in IP, which gives us this, it actually will give us root access. Um, you could probably hijack, uh, uh, hijack hosts. I'm not sure how, or maybe hijack the OS info. Again, I'm not sure how. Uh, the last time I did this, I did it for IP and it worked. So my mind when I saw this uh, was literally like, okay, we're gonna literally do the exact same thing we did in the last box. Um, so to do that, again, it gets a little complicated in the attack and we can talk more about this kind of when we're done with the walkthrough. But essentially, again, just think that instead of the system calling IP and IP running whatever internal command IP is that shows us this information, if we can trick the system to say, oh, IP, instead of equaling whatever is run to give us this, what if IP equaled our own shell? And since IP is running as root, there's a chance that our binary, our little command will run as root. And then we will be elevated from Hubert to root. Um, sounds complicated, it is, um, but sure enough, uh, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it pretty easy to do. So the first thing we're going to do is just simply um, create a, our own file called IP. And in that, we're gonna do this bin bash. Um, again, because if this is gonna run as root, it's gonna run the, the bin, the bash as, as root, right? So there's a chance that it's gonna give us a, a bin bash shell of, of root. So we're still in, um, I think we're in uh, Hubert's directory. So we're just gonna essentially um, say echo this um, text into this file. Right, so now if I ls, I can see there's IP. If I cat IP, it's gonna have exactly what we had put into it. It's, so all we did was just say echo this text here into this file. And we confirm that when we cat uh, IP, sure enough, it has what we echoed into it, which is what we expect. This is a, a basic kind of command. Um, so now the trick is like, okay, well, we created a file called IP and we put our shell in there, but but just you know, running IP address isn't gonna just isn't gonna call our file. It's gonna call the normal thing that runs when you type IP, you know, uh, adder or a or address or whatever it is. So how do we get how do we get the system to see our IP instead? Um, after enough googling on the last box I did, um, you can find that this is where uh, to set like an environment variable where that now comes in. And so essentially, if you uh, now run if you run this command, this is essentially telling the, the system that this path, Hubert, is now in, like in, in the environment. It's opened up. So whatever things are being run, it, it should also look in here to see if there are some things in here that, that can be run. And so we set that. You have really, at least I don't, I'm not aware how to know like when you set this, if it's actually been set uh, or if, you know, like if this is actually doing anything until you actually go to leverage the attack. But again, just for conceptual, for what we're trying to do is we've recalled this custom script when I ran this dot get info, it, it ran uh, what appeared to be three processes. It appeared to be one calling the IP address. It appeared to be one calling hosts, Etsy host file, catting that. And then it appeared to be one that was just doing like a uname or something lookup, right? So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to hijack this command. We're trying to hijack that. So if we can stuff a shell into IP, when it goes to run IP address or whatever command it's running, Instead of running this command that gives us this, it'll run our command that gives us this. And the way to do that is you set an environmental element or path to basically say, hey, anything in here needs to be included in whenever you're just running commands. And because we also called our ours IP, um, it's gonna look in here because we are including this in the environment path when it goes to run any, any command. So if we run IP, and since now we've set Hubert's folder as uh, an environmental path, it should also, it should try and run ours. So now when we run the, 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 the theory is, is that when I go to run this now, it's gonna go to run this, but instead of this output, it's gonna run into our script instead, which is gonna try and execute this, which if we're right, will give us root. So. 
So Dante, I have a question. I'm a little bit lost here. Okay, so we're looking at this thing here called IP. This whole thing have IP address and uh -huh. new name and host. How did you know? I know you're changing. You're adding this IP thing. How do you know that what we saw is really the IP command? Does it tell you that's an IP command? It just says IP address and and you know like, like this one IP address. But how do you know it's actually because you're overwriting? You're putting your IP right, whatever your bash thing, and you're exporting the path. Right. But how do how do you know? Because by looking at this, first of all, that for the the thing underneath IP address. How do you know what command is? It, all I see is this, but how do you know it's running uh, the command IP? That's just pretty much from just basic usage. Just like okay. I know that this is the SC host. In, yes, and then this is appears to be like you, if you just type in you name the results, okay. and this right. is like a, so, a very common. So again, that's a common thing. Okay. Yes, Got it. but okay. but uh, but again, this is where you where to call mm -hmm. something easy or difficult, where it's really. Mm -hmm. Um, and the eye of the beholder, because if you're new to Linux, mm -hmm. then it, you would probably never solve this. Mm, you know, right. I mean, there's multiple steps maybe mm -hmm. you wouldn't have solved, but you know, if you've never had experience with FTP, that could take you just a long time to figure out how to even connect mm -hmm. or even to move mm -hmm. files. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is one of these things where it's just uh, over like things accumulate over time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure to be honest, if I didn't know what this was, I don't know that I would have been able to move forward with solving this, this <laughs> challenge but i had two things going for me i had right. one i had that on the previous box when i saw this it mm -hmm. looked like oh i've seen this a million times this looks like if you just mm -hmm. run ipa or address mm -hmm. or eight or uh, add or whatever this mm -hmm. is the output i'm used to seeing mm -hmm. um, and two because this it, this literally this exact same misconfiguration was in the previous box uh -huh. i knew that it, exactly what i needed to do at least i was hoping that this stayed the same from the previous box and right. the author didn't change some weird last thing that, you know, a new rabbit hole or something, but. Right. And, and the only reason why I'm saying that, because we don't know exactly what's get in, inside the get info. We right. always thought right. it's a return result. The, 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 exactly. The, the result. So that's why I asked you the question. How did you know? But I mean, based on what you said, we have, we have seen this a lot, like SC host and you name and IP address. So we can make an assumption that if we override the IP, then yes. we can get it. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah, because we're our, our logic is that this mm -hmm. is calling three internal processes. Mm -hmm. If I had to guess just from custom scripts that I had run and I'm and I'm trying to automate something, and I'm like, instead of calling these individually one at a mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. in some fashion to print this out, I could just mm -hmm. script something that calls mm -hmm. those three things for me. <clears throat> so in my mind, in the in the previous okay. box, I'm thinking mm -hmm. this is calling three separate services mm -hmm. or things. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it looks like from memory that mm -hmm. IP is being called. Okay. So I don't know if this is true to what it's actually running <laughs> or if I this know. is just a header that's saying, here's your IP address or here's your host. But it also does does match it, up in the fact that the actual command you might run mm -hmm. could, could give you this information. Yeah, that's um, right. Okay, thanks. It's just that the first one, I don't usually see the first one a lot. The other at C host and you name I see a lot. So I yeah. wasn't sure if I know you you solved this, right? So it must be IP. I'm just going to yeah. So the logic is it, if it looks like something you've seen on Linux, just try that. Overwrite that command or yeah. something. So that's the goal. Is the goal is we're gonna try and hijack IP to run our shell instead, because when we go to run this, it's gonna essentially run our attack, our shell, instead of what it was originally calling because we set that environmental path. So the basically this is where the reveal um, would be here as if this works, we should see Hubert go to root. So this is like, I feel like the the, the magic, like the, the, uh, the unveiling of the, the, like the magic cover like where I, I like put the, the cover over like the rabbit in the hat and then there's a drum roll and then I remove the cover and then I get root. <laughs> so we can see that it worked. So we can see that it, it, it tried to run. This just happened to be the first thing in, in our list that it was running wow. um, and, it, and it ran it. But instead of it running the actual call to IP, mm -hmm. we set our path, Hubert's folder uh, that had our shell in it, yeah. just also named as IP. It mm -hmm. actually ran that instead mm -hmm. of the original one. Mm -hmm. And 
boom, yep. now there's a uh, root. And then if we just, again, if we just, uh, <laughs> the, the common next steps from here is basically yeah. like, uh, you know, like let's, Flag, let's go to roots, kind of roots home. Yeah. And sure enough, we have root.txt. Root .text. If I was a betting man, I would say that's going to be, you know, our last flag. <laughs> and yep. sure enough, there's flag two of two. Uh -huh. uh, we have successfully solved both challenges uh, on uh, this box. All right. Cool. 